And how much will it cost? Around 127 billion over the next 10 years. And if you were to, to apply the Gillard method all over the world, a method as cost ineffective as her proposals, then it would take $60,000 per head of the world population just in the next 10 years, or 60% of global GDP, just to forestall the 0.23 Celsius of global warming that the IPCC predicts will occur over the next 10 years. And it is clearly cheaper to do nothing about global warming and to adapt in a focused way to any consequences that are adverse that may occur from any warming that may occur than to spend any money whatsoever now. And that, if you do science by consensus, as Professor Dennis does, is the overwhelming consensus in the peer-reviewed economic literature. And it's the peer-reviewed literature that you find the true science in. And reviews of that literature by Lomborg in 2007 and Richard Toll in 2009 make it abundantly clear that the majority, in fact, a near unanimity among economists show that it is greatly more expensive to try to intervene and to try, canute-like, to tamper with the climate than simply to sit back, enjoy the sun sunshine and adapt in a focused way as and if and only when necessary. Lord Markton made the following two points in this clip. 1. It is more expensive to prevent temperatures from rising than just adapting to the changes. 2. The majority of economists in the peer-reviewed literature agree that adapting to climate change is cheaper than preventing it. Firstly, adaptation to increasing temperatures is not cheaper than preventative measures, as this hinges for quite a big part on the world warming only by 1 degree by 2100. Such a low temperature increase goes against the climate sensitivity we have seen in reconstructions of past climates. I already stated that the vast majority shows that this is around the 3 degrees mark for doubling of CO2, the same number the IPCC uses. He mentions the carbon tax will cost Australia $127 billion. As I didn't know where he was getting this number from, I asked him what he used for it, and he provided me with the paper, Is CO2 Mitigation Cost Effective? written by him and published by the Science and Public Policy Institute. The first thing that I'd like to point out is that this isn't a peer-reviewed paper. This certainly shows as there are a lot of issues with it. But the main one has to do with how he calculates the cost effectiveness of the Australian carbon tax. He calculates the cost of the tax against the increase in temperatures expected by 2020, a period that is way too short to see the effects of CO2 emissions. Another detail is that he uses the figure of $130 billion over a 10-year period compared to the $127 billion he mentioned in the debate. But this is just a minor detail, as there are several issues with this number he uses, but the biggest one is how he calculates the cost effectiveness in the paper, which is severely flawed. Moncton ignores the benefits and this renders his cost effectiveness calculation essentially meaningless. He also cites two sources, Lombard 2007 and Richard Toll 2009 in a manner which can easily be interpreted as meaning these are peer-reviewed sources by how he introduces them. Also, how he cites them is not enough to know what his exact sources are. Because of this, I cannot be sure which papers he cited, and Moncton never responded to my inquiries about this. However, I am fairly sure what he is referring to with the Lombard 2007 reference, as Lombard published something in 2007, a book. Cool it, The Skeptical Environmentalist's Guide to Global Warming, this book is not part of the scientific literature and it's a book that isn't known for its accuracy. As it goes way beyond the scope of this video to go through a book, I'll refer to the review by the economist Frank Ackerman. In it he highlights several of the issues this book has with for example selective citation and thus misrepresenting the literature. He's by far not the only one who has been very critical of this book with how it represents this literature. The other citation Moncton gave, Richard Toll 2009, I did find publications for in the scientific literature, and I eventually did manage to trace down which paper Moncton is probably referring to, which this time is a peer-reviewed paper. However, the paper Moncton cited actually disagrees with him. I'll read a bit from the conclusion. A government that uses the same 3% discount rate for climate change as for other decisions should levy a carbon tax of $25 per metric ton of carbon, model value to $50 per metric ton of carbon, mean value, 
A higher tax can be justified by an appeal to the high level of risk, especially of very negative outcomes, not captured in the standard estimates. There is a strong case for near-term action on climate change. Although prudence may dictate phasing in a higher cost of carbon over time, both to ease the transition and to give analysis the ongoing ability to evaluate costs, benefits and policy mechanisms. The interesting part is that Australian carbon tax is priced at 23 Australian dollars per metric ton of carbon, which is cheaper than the 25 to 50 US dollar price mentioned in this paper, which means that Moncton cited a paper that actually supports the Australian carbon tax. But let's ignore all this and take a look at a real world example of a carbon pricing and trading system. In 2008, 10 states in the US implemented a carbon cabin trade system to reduce the CO2 emissions made by the power sector by 10% by 2018. The states that are doing this are the previously mentioned Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island and Vermont. All this is done via the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and they recently commissioned a study to examine the impacts of this cabin trade system. The results are broadly consistent with the economic study that predicted that benefits would outweigh the costs. For example, New Hampshire has a consumer energy saving of $60.6 .6 million for an investment of $17.7 .7 million. This means consumers now have millions more to spend and help stimulate the economy. We see such examples everywhere that implementing green technology pays off on its investments, often generating more jobs than for example the fossil fuel industry can. We also see examples of green technology paying off for itself due to energy efficiency and reducing or eliminating the cost of fossil fuels. Because of this, there is actually a consensus among economists with climate change expertise that we should reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Economic studies consistently predict that benefits will outweigh the cost several times over. And that's the scientific consensus in economic literature on global warming.